you will, turn in your Bibles to the first chapter of the book of Romans as we continue our study through the Word. Now, this book, uh, this epistle that we have before us is truly an amazing, exciting uh, letter that was uh, written uh, and recorded for us. It is written by the Apostle Paul. Paul is the uh, author of this uh, letter. And you remember where the book of Acts uh, ended. The book of Acts ended where Paul, after his third missionary journey comes to Jerusalem with the gift, uh, the love offering to the poor. He's arrested. He heads to Caesarea. He's in Caesarea for two years. And then finally, he's transported to Rome, a tumultuous uh, shipwreck in Malta. And finally, he he arrives uh, there in uh, Rome. And that's where the book of Acts leaves off. And so it's a great segue into the book of Romans. Now, Paul writes to the Romans three years earlier than where we are seeing Paul was left off in the book of Acts. Paul writes this at the end of his uh, third missionary journey. You'll remember it's winter time. And so he is in Corinth. It is right uh, in during those three months uh, that he is in Corinth that he writes this letter to the uh, Romans. After the winter is over, Paul heads uh, and goes to Philippi. That's where he celebrates Passover. And then you'll remember he wants to get to Jerusalem by Pentecost in order to bring that and gift to them. So Paul writes this in the winter of his third missionary journey. He lets them know that, man, he wants to come to Rome. His desire is to be able to minister to them there in uh, Rome. And so one of the reasons that he writes this is to uh, let them know that that is uh, his desire. But he also now, instead of him being there to minister, he wants this letter now to minister to him. And so what we are going to see is this letter is incredibly practical for our faith. It is filled uh, uh, with instruction, but also you're really going to understand your faith after we work through the book uh, of uh, uh, Romans. And in particular, one of the things that that we hope to truly discover is a fresh awareness of the grace of God. Grace uh, is a a subject, a topic uh, that we are really going to be looking at. It is that unmerited, unwarranted, unearned, undeserved, absolute in favor of God. God pours his grace out upon us because that's his nature. He is love and love pours itself out. And we are the recipients, not because we're in a position to where we've earned it or deserved it. It is because of the goodness of God that he pours out his love upon us. And we are the recipients of his great, great grace. And, and so... We see that uh, Paul now is going to uh, begin the typical format of a letter in that day was starting off by identifying who it is that's writing, and then second, who they're writing to, and then third would be a greeting or a a, a salutation, and then after that is going to be the the letter itself. And so the uh, first few verses, we are going to see those three introductory parts. We begin in the first verse, chapter one, book of Romans, and it says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. So Paul identifies himself, look at as a bond servant of Jesus Christ. So what's the difference between a servant and a bond servant? Uh, Well, uh, a servant is there by contract or obligation, but a bond servant is someone who is a servant out of love. They are there by choice and they are serving because they are connected and attached uh, to their household. Here we see that Paul calls himself, he, he's a servant, but he's a bond servant. The basis of that relationship is his love for our Lord and Savior. So he's a bond servant of Jesus Christ 
called now to be an apostle. Now, what's an apostle? The word apostle means someone who is sent out with authority. You'll remember how Paul on the Damascus road when he meets the, uh, the Lord and the Lord um, blinds him and then shows him the things that he is going to suffer and then makes him into an ambassador to the Gentiles uh, with the gospel. He's going to bring the gospel, the good news now to the Gentiles. It says that he was separated to the gospel of God. What is the gospel of God? What's the good news of God that Paul had now been commissioned to go and to share with the Gentile world? Well, the gospel of God is, is that the promised Savior, the Messiah, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he's come. And in his coming, he has redeemed mankind and dealt with our sin. He has washed away our sin as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So that which separated us from God has been removed and we can now be connected to a holy, righteous, loving God. And so that's the good news of God. We see the good news of God in verse 2, which which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ uh, our Lord. So this good news of God is not the new news of God. It's the old news uh, of God. You see, God had promised that he was going to send this Messiah. Over 300 promises and prophecies in the Old Testament uh, referring to this Savior, to this King. A King is going to come who is going to set this world uh, right, who is going to sit upon the throne of David and whose reign will never end. And so the prophecies continuing to show us and identify who this king is, who this savior is, who this redeemer of mankind is going to be. And so it was promised before through his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. There Paul declares that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the promised one from the scriptures and he is the good news of God. It says, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection resurrection from the dead. So Christ was born of the seed of David. Uh, what does that mean? Well, that's one of the fulfillments uh, of the prophecies uh, that there were. You'll remember when that happened. David, King David, He's in his palace. Nathan is the prophet that was with him. And David is living in opulence, in luxury. He, he looks out from his balcony and there's the tabernacle of meeting. That's the place where people would worship. And he's observing the worshipers going in and out of this tent of meeting. It had traveled around with them and it had been moved now to Jerusalem. And, and David looks at that tent where God is dwelling. He looks at the palace where he's dwelling and He's like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to build God a house. I'm going to build a temple for God. And you know what, Nathan? I'm not going to spare any expense. This is going to be the most magnificent building ever for God to be able to dwell in. And Nathan the prophet looks at him and says, do all that is in your heart, David. That would be awesome. And, and that night, the Lord visits Nathan the prophet and says, Nathan, did you check with me first before you told David that he was allowed to build that in temple? He can't build the temple. He's a man of war. He's got blood on his hands. You have to go back there tomorrow and tell him that he can't build the temple for me. But go and tell him that while he can't build a house for me, tell him I'm going to build him a house. Tell him that from his house, his lineage, his offspring, the Messiah is going to come and he will be known as the son of David. And so Nathan has to go back into King David the next day. King, I got some good news, bad news uh, for you here. And tells him he can't, uh, he can't build him the temple, but that God is going to have the Messiah come from his offspring. And David is just undone with the grace of God just the unmerited, unwarranted favor. He, he is like, who am I? I was just a shepherd boy. 
I, I, I was a boy out in the fields keeping sheep and, and you took me and you established me as king over the nation of Israel and now on top of that, through my offspring, the Messiah is going to come. And so one of the titles of Jesus, of the Messiah, is son of David. And so as, as Paul is writing out to hear the beginning of the book of <coughs> Romans talking about this good news, the good news is as the promised king uh, has come and his name is Jesus Christ and, uh, and he is the one prophesied and he is the, the son of David that the scriptures speak about. And it says that he declared to be the son of God uh, with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You remember when Jesus was cleansing the temple that, uh, that the authorities came to him and said, by what authority do you do these things? Show us a, a sign that uh, you are who you say that you are. And, and Jesus responded and said, no sign will be given to this wicked and adulterous generation except for the sign of Jonah the prophet. He says, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so also will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so the resurrection was the absolute confirming sign that Jesus is exactly who he said. He says, I have the power to lay my life down and to pick my life back uh, up again. He holds life and light and the power of eternal life uh, in his hands. And so it was through the resurrection that he demonstrated with absolute proof that every single thing that he said uh, is true. It is through him verse 5 through Jesus that we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ so it is through Christ that the blessings flow into our hearts and into our lives and, and it says among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ so here is a definition we are the saints if you're a believer if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior here in the book of Romans you are the called and so that is a term now that every time we see it know that that is referring to the people that have accepted that gift of salvation that Jesus came and offered so verse 7 begins now to all who are in Rome he began with an introduction of himself now who is this letter written to to all who are in Rome beloved of God called called to be saints and grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, notice that he's not writing to the church that's uh, in Rome, but he is writing to all of the believers uh, that are in Rome uh, itself. Uh, and then he goes on with the salutation, grace to you and peace from God our Father <laughs> and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is a typical salutation of uh, Paul and the letters that he writes in the epistles, you will see the twin pillars of grace and peace used together. Now, I want you to know that they're always in that order. It's always grace first and then peace. Why? Because you first have to be a partaker of the grace of God before you can enjoy the peace of God. You see, the grace of God is us having our sins removed. For by grace, you've been saved through faith in that, not of yourselves. It's a free gift from God. And so that which separates us from God needs to be removed first, and that is our salvation, the grace that we have received. Then we can enjoy fellowship with God. We can enjoy peace with God. So the grace of God, we have to experience that first before we can enter into the peace of our God and Father. In verse 8, he now begins the letter. He says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son that without ceasing 
I make mention of you always in my prayers. We see here that Paul begins by letting them know that throughout the whole world they have heard that there are believers that are there in the city of Rome. Remember that Rome is the capital and city of the Roman Empire. It is the most prestigious and prominent of all the cities that there are. And there are believers that are there. Paul says that wherever I go, we hear of believers that are there in Rome. You'll remember when Paul was in Corinth that he met Priscilla and Aquila that were Jewish believers that had been kicked out of Rome when the emperor expelled all of the Jews uh, out of uh, Rome. And, and so they were believers that had come uh, out uh, of Rome. He says that, uh, that faith, that your faith uh, is talked about in, in all of the other churches that the gospel had reached Rome. Paul hadn't reached Rome, but the gospel had uh, reached Rome. He says, I, I pray for you uh, always. I don't cease praying for you there in Rome. He says, making requests, verse 10, if by some means, now at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. That is that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Paul says, I'm praying for you, I'm interceding, and, and one of the prayers that I make is that I'm gonna be able to come and see you. He says, I, I long to come and to visit you, not to see the sights of Rome, not to be in the imperial city. He says, but to come and to see you, to, to impart and spiritual gifts to you that I might encourage you, and guess what? That you also would be able to encourage me. And Paul here is talking about Christian fellowship. When we get together and we fellowship in the uh, Lord with one another, and Paul is saying that, that there is in such a that glorious blessedness of that fellowship. I can ask you, hey, how are you doing in your walk with the Lord? What are the things that are happening in, in your life that you're excited about? And you can share that with me. And, and then I'll share with you the things that God is doing in my life. And, and we can pray for one another. What are your challenges or struggles or trials that I can be encouraging you? And there is that mutual building up of our faith, one with the other. The Bible says that Iron sharpens iron that we can come together and we are blessing each other. Paul says, I, I long to be able to come to, to Rome to be able to see you so that we can be an encouragement to one another. He says, now I don't want you to be unaware, verse 13, brethren, that I often planned to come to you but was hindered uh, until now that I might have some fruit among you also just as among the other Gentiles. He says, I, I also want to be able to help organize and build up the church there in, in Rome as well. He says, I, I have planned, but I have been hindered from coming to you. Hindered by the Holy Spirit. Remember how uh, on Paul's second missionary journey when uh, he wants to go to Asia, he wants to get to Ephesus and the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him and then he's going to go to Bithynia and the Holy Spirit won't uh, let him go there, redirect him. Paul is a man that's underneath the authority of the, the Lord and so his desire is to go to Rome but the Holy Spirit keeps uh, leading him uh, elsewhere and, and he's saying it's my desire that as soon as I have that opportunity and the Holy Spirit uh, lets me, my plan is to uh, come to Rome. He says that, that I might have some fruit among you just as among the other Gentiles. He says in verse 14 something interesting. He says, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. I'm a debtor, he says, a debtor to both Greeks uh, and to barbarians. Now, remember in the Greek world to the Greeks, if you weren't a Greek, you were a barbarian. So Greek and barbarian, there's only two divisions. That's saying everybody in the world. Then he says wise and unwise. So that once again is this expansive, comprehensive statement. And here he says, I'm a, I'm a debtor to, to everybody that is around me. What is, what is Paul talking about when he says that 
he's a debtor. Well, that word debtor means uh, obligated. He, he's saying, I feel, I feel an obligation. You'll remember that Jesus had commissioned him to take the good news of the gospel and to bring it to the, to the Gentiles. And Paul feels like he can't just go on vacation and retire and kick up his feet and relax and enjoy life when he's got the good news, the gospel, to be able to go and to bring to people. People who are sitting in darkness, he's got the lamp of the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To those who are imprisoned in bondages, he's got the keys to be able to go and to set them free. And so he feels this obligation to be able to, to go and to help uh, everybody that is uh, around him as he had been commissioned by the Lord uh, as an apostle, once sent out with authority to bring that freedom, that light, and that life that is in Christ to, to those who don't know him. And so uh, he says, I I'm ready. He says, I'm ready to go and to preach the gospel to, to you who are in Rome uh, uh, also. And, uh, and so... Uh, Paul is, is definitely uh, ready to go and to preach. That's not the issue. He says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, uh, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. In a sophisticated city like uh, Rome, we see that Paul is declaring that he's not embarrassed with the, with the gospel. He is not embarrassed with the philosophers. He, he has the, the keys to salvation that is found in putting your faith in Christ. And so he's not ashamed of preaching the gospel even in the imperial city of uh, Rome. He said it is is the power of salvation for everyone who believes. You see, salvation is the free gift that God offers to everybody. But that gift has to be received. God is not going to force anybody to receive that gift. And so he invites you. You're invited. You have an invitation. But you have to RSVP. You have to open it up and receive it. And so for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. So Paul talks about the way that this gift, this salvation has come to mankind. It came through Christ and Christ came to his own. Jesus was a Jew. And it says that he came to his own and his own received him not. Uh, and so after salvation was offered to the Jews, it, that went from there out into the Samaritans and then ultimately to the Gentiles. Whenever Paul would go into a new city, remember how he would start by going into the synagogues, preaching in the synagogues, and then uh, afterwards uh, he would go out to the Gentiles. And so salvation has come to the Jew first uh, and then to the Greeks or to the Gentiles. He says in verse 17, for, it is, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so we see here that this is one of the most quoted verses from the Old Testament that we have in the New Testament. It comes from Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. And it deals with the fact that once we are saved, the just, the justified, people that are saved, we are saved by faith, but we also live by faith. In other words, that birth, that new birth is by faith. And that's where we're connected to God. And then it continues our connection connection to God continues by faith. So it's not a one and done, but it is the beginning of a new relationship where we are connected now and the eternal life flows into us through that connection that we have with God. The justified, those that are saved are going to live their life by faith. In verse 18, he now is going to talk about uh, the wrath uh, of God on the unrighteous. Uh, we see, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because 
what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. So here we see that Paul now is talking about the wrath of God against those that are going to deny that he exists. An atheist who says there is no God or refuses to put himself underneath the authority of God, they are going to ultimately experience the, uh, the wrath of God. He says in verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, understood, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without uh, excuse. Paul is saying that every single person on the face of the earth, God has revealed himself to them. His invisible attributes are seen in what? In his creation. When you look around, that nature declares the glory of God. So if you're going to say God doesn't exist, you're going to have to suppress the truth of what God has clearly revealed to every single heart. God has given to everybody a conscience, and God has revealed himself uh, in his in creation. And so to say that God doesn't exist uh, and to refuse to be in a relationship with God, you are suppressing uh, now the truth of what God has uh, revealed. And so uh, he says that they are without excuse uh, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts uh, uh, were darkened. Uh, and so, once again, here we see that God is not going to force himself on anybody. They refuse to believe in him. They refuse to have a relationship, though God created them. And God's desire is, is that they would be in communion with them. For God so loved the world uh, that he gave his only begotten son, willing that none should perish and that all should come to eternal life. But uh, they reject it. God. They don't want to believe in him. They don't want a relationship with him. The Bible says that the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. And so they are foolish because you are either going to experience the grace of God or the wrath of God. You are either going to be with him eternally or you're going to be separated from him eternally. And so it is that foolish person that chooses to be separated from God eternally. He says, professing to be wise. They, they think that they're wise, but they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and, and, and creeping things. Professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools. You see, anybody that tries to explain the world around you without God, apart from God, separated from God, eh, is foolish. They declare that they are wise, but in essence, they are for all philosophy. Philosophy is the attempt to understand the world around us without God, without God. And so now making up your systems of ideologies and beliefs and arguments, that's all philosophy. It's all vanity. It's worthless. It is foolishness. When Science tries to explain the world around us apart from God. It's, it's foolishness. And evolution is foolishness. It's, it's interesting. You know, in evolution, they believe in the Big Bang. They believe that all matter was compressed together, held by an incredible strong force, and then that force released, the universe exploded outward, that we are currently living in an expanding universe that is heading outward, and they will give us the, uh, the number of miles that it is expanding outward. And, and, I, I, and I want you to know, I believe in the Big Bang. I believe that God said, bang, and there it was, and it exploded outward, and, and it's being made measured and in that time I've got no problem with that whatsoever but ask them where all the matter came from ask them where everything that exploded outward that is the universe ask them where that came from they have absolutely no answer for you 
You see, trying to explain the, uh, the universe, the world, the matter in which we live in apart from God is just simple foolishness. But they declare themselves uh, to be wise uh, when they try and explain uh, all that is apart from God. It says in verse 24 that therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies uh, among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who was who blessed for ever. Amen. So here we see that God now, when you reject God, then God is going to allow you to be given over to the carnal passions uh, of your life. Now, we see that these are people that reject the moral authority of God. Today in our culture, that's exactly what is happening. They are saying there is no such thing as moral truth, that no one can know moral truth and no one is the author of moral truth, that morality is an individual choice and that if it's not hurting anybody. I'm free to do whatever I want with my body. I won't judge you. You don't judge me. And there is no moral authority on the face of the earth. That's what's being taught in our culture today to this next generation. But we see that God says that when you reject God's authority for morality, then what happens is you've removed God from being the author of morality. And what happens is you've replaced God with yourself. You become the authority for morality. And this is to be an accepting, inclusive, non-judgmental uh, definition of uh, morality. And, and this is now what the culture, you've replaced God as the author of morality to individuals uh, and to yourselves, promoting yourself to figure out you're the author, you are the authority of morality. God says that when you do that, when you place yourself as the moral authority over what is right and wrong, what's going to happen is your carnality and your natural lusts are going to start to take over in your life. And you are going to enter into a downward spiral. Because listen to this, the flesh is never satisfied. The flesh always wants a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And the next spin and the next turn and in it is the downward uh, cycle of sin. And God says that if you choose to ignore him, if you play God in your own life, if you're going to be the moral authority, then he's going to allow that to happen. He's going to let you have your free will, but it's not going to end up well for you. And so uh, he says uh, now, uh, that they are now serving the creature, the creature, God's creation. You have become God. <laughs> and now you are going to be serving the God that you are creating in your life instead of the true and the living God who's blessed forever. Amen. He says, for this reason, verse 26, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. He's talking about lesbianism right here. Uh, women with women. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing that in which is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error in which it was due. And so here we see that Paul uses homosexuality both in the female and the male expressions as an example of God giving mankind over to their lust. Now, I want you to know that homosexuality isn't anything that's new. Back in the Roman Empire, I, I want you to know that the emperors and the leaders and homosexuality was absolutely rampant. When Paul is writing this, homosexuality is rampant in the Roman Empire and in the culture. It was completely uh, acceptable uh, in that day. And Paul is using this uh, as an example. Now, whatever happened to the Roman Empire, who came in and conquered this great uh, empire that there was? 
People will tell you that what happened with Rome is no one conquered Rome. It rotted from within and then it collapsed in upon itself. And so here we see Paul just using this as, uh, as an example of his day, not our day. He's not talking about what's going on in, in our culture. He's talking about the things that were going on 2,000 years ago in a culture, the dominant power in the world that had now embraced uh, the immoral vileness uh, that had led them into a downward spiral. And, and he says, this is what happens when you remove God from being the moral agent of a society and you now let your own passions and your own carnality be the moral judge of what is right and wrong. And so he says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things uh, which are not in fitting. And so we see here that they move towards whatever it is that their heart desires, everybody doing what's right uh, in their own eyes because they have rejected uh, the moral authority of God. Paul is gonna describe a culture. Now, once you reject God as the moral agent and his moral authority, how do people get along? How does society sustain itself and, and what will be the end result of it? You see, every single society, every culture is either moving closer to God or they're moving further away from God. Paul is gonna describe in the next verses what happens when you throw God out and you allow people now his creation to be the moral governance uh, uh, over society. And, and as we read through this, I want you to ask yourselves uh, whether or not you feel as a nation, uh, are we moving closer to God uh, or as a culture and a nation, are we moving further away from God? If we're moving further away from God, then we would see an increase in the description of what Paul is gonna give us in the next few verses. So, or if we as a culture are moving closer closer to the authority of God in our lives, we're going to see a decrease uh, of these things. And so and Paul says that now that uh, that God's given them over to a, a debased uh, mind uh, to do the things that are <coughs> not fitting. It says being filled with all unrighteousness. And now he begins to describe what a culture is going to look like if they remove the moral authority of God uh, from it. It says uh, that they now being filled with all unrighteousness, they're going to be filled with sexual immorality, with wickedness, with covetousness, with maliciousness. They're gonna be full of envy, murder, strife. So we see that the, that the relationship of society is gonna to begin to break down, that there is going to be more aggression, there's gonna be more strife, there's gonna be more division with each other, there's gonna be more violence, things are gonna to start to teeter, if you will, and, and percolate in here. Murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God. Haters of God. Keep God out of this. We're going to separate God from our culture. The separation of church and state is nothing more than an attempt to move God out of the marketplace of our culture so that we are not accountable to his moral authority over our lives. And, and so they are violent. They are haters of God. They're proud. They're boasters. They're inventors of evil things. They're disobedient to, to parents. They're undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve those who practice them. It says that they're gonna be proud. They're gonna be proud of their sin. 
They're going to have parades about their sin. They're going to not only are they going to have parades, but they're going to applaud, it says, everybody else uh, who is also in, involved in the sin, and they are going to encourage not only what they're practicing, but they're going to encourage uh, everybody else to practice it as well, having no shame whatsoever in their sin. And this is what Paul says, that when you remove yourself from the moral authority of God, God is the one that has declared what's right and what's wrong, what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. When you remove God as that moral authority, ultimately what you are going to see is a downward spiral as the carnality of man and the fallen nature of man is going to have its foothold. And ultimately it will not lead us up it will not be progressive. It will not be uh, an evolution up, but it will be a devolvement down into the base nature uh, of uh, mankind. When we look at the in chapter one of the book of Romans, we, we walk away with a clear understanding that regardless, listen, regardless of whether a culture is moving closer to God or a culture is moving away from God. The bottom line of Romans chapter one is, is that every single one of us needs a savior, amen? That there is none righteous, no, uh, not one. And so that is the, the ultimate message here of this first chapter uh, of the book of Romans. As we close our study, I wanna draw our attention for just a minute back to verse one, back to where Paul says that he's a bond servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. That was interesting to me, separated to. You see, normally it's a separating from. You normally get separated from the group and, <laughs> and you are lost. You, you separate the dark clothes from the light and clothes. Christ is gonna separate the, the sheep from the goats. It's normally a separation from. But notice here that Paul doesn't say what he was separated from. Notice that he says what he was separated to. It is forward looking to where he is going, not uh, from where he has come. Now, what was he separated from? It's interesting because he was a Pharisee. And the word Pharisee means someone who is mm -mm, separated. You see, the Pharisees were the ones that they saw the Greek culture and they saw the loose morals of the Greek culture. And as Alexander the Great had conquered the whole world, the influence of the Greek culture spread across the whole world underneath their dominion and continued underneath the, uh, the, the, the Roman Empire as, as well. And the Jews saw that their people now uh, underneath the liberal thinking of the, uh, of the Greeks uh, were starting to move away from the law of God. And so the, the Pharisees were the ones who said, we are not compromising on God's word. We are gonna continue to live separate from the culture and we're gonna obey God's law. Now, here was the problem, great intention of the heart. I mean, as they started to focus on keeping the law in their heart, they started to have a relationship with the law instead of a relationship with God. It became about the do's and the don'ts and who was doing more of the do's and less of the don'ts. And if I'm doing more do's than you, then, then you know what? I, God loves me more than he loves you because I am being a better Jew than, uh, than you are being. And what it does is it turns God uh, into a... A, a rewarder and a punisher now uh, of your own actions. Uh, the, the more that I obey God, the more that I'm going to be blessed. The more that I disobey God, the more that I'm going to be punished. And so now my punishment and my reward is based upon the rules uh, uh, that I'm keeping or that I'm not keeping. And, and what you end up with is a relationship with a set of rules. How am I doing with my rules? Am I doing more bad things or more good things? Is there less bad things in my life than used to be? Am I, am I doing more of the good things than I used to be? And so you start measuring yourself against a set of rules. You see, Christianity isn't a religion. 
It's a relationship. It's not about the the rules and regulations. Paul was called out of this, this relationship with rules and regulations. You see, the part of that problem was the self righteousness that ended up in the hearts of the Pharisees. They thought that they were better Jews and that God loved them more if they were keeping more of the law than others. But you remember what Jesus said. Jesus said that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, that you will by no means enter into the kingdom of God. You see, the rules and the regulations, the law, was never meant for anybody to be able to say, I'm more righteous than somebody else, and I now deserve to be rewarded with heaven. The purpose of the rules and the regulations, the law, that God gave, number one, was to reflect his character and his purpose. But number two, it was to show every single person when you measure yourself against the law that you're a sinner, (laughs) that you fall short, that you are a lawbreaker. And so it wasn't meant to justify anybody. It was meant to be able to tell everybody that they fall short. So Paul was separated from this system of trying to feel that I'm better than others by doing more of the things that God wants into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, my concern and uh, and my desire is to make sure that we don't take and turn Christianity into a, a set of rules and regulations and then start to look at those rules and regulations as, as a barometer to how I'm doing as a Christian. You see, we've been set apart. We've been separated from our old sins. We've been separated from the bondages and the, uh, the activities that we used to do. But we don't measure ourselves by what we've been separated from We measure ourselves but what we've been separated to. And what have you been separated to is to a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, when I want to talk about how you're doing spiritually, I don't want to know about your sin. I I don't want you to tell me if you've got more sin than you used to have or less sin than you have. That's not what the measurement is. The measurement is this. How close are you to the Lord? How healthy is your relationship with the Lord? Ah, that's different than rule keeping. The relationship with Jesus Christ. See, what makes a healthy relationship? What, what makes a, a solid marriage and a good marriage and a good union? Well, number one, it, it takes communication. You need to be spending time with each other and you need to be in communicating. You need to talk and be honest and transparent If you're just a wall and you're not sharing anything that's going on inside of you, then there is no communication that's taking place. You you have to listen and spend time to listen to what God has to say to you, what the Lord has to say to you. And there needs to be a commitment to protect that relationship. You see, sin, you know what the problem with sin is? Sin hurts your relationship with the Lord. So we don't want to sin, not because we're going to get in trouble, but because when you love someone, you don't want to do anything that's going to hurt that relationship. You want to bless the relationship and protect the relationship. And that relationship is your blessing. And, and so sin isn't about getting your hands slapped or God being mad at you or, or smiting you. It's about your hurting your relationship. When you're in a marriage, you don't want to do anything that's going to hurt the other person and is going to hurt that relationship. And so suddenly sin is not about rules and regulations. It's about relationship. It's about love. It's about intimacy with uh, the Lord. And ultimately, we are going to spend eternity wrapped up in his light, in his love, in his presence. Do you know that one day you're going to know the Lord the way that you're known by him. God says he knows your risings up and your goings down. He's, he, he's crazy about you. And that knowledge that he has, the very hairs on your head are numbered. You're going to know God in such a way and be connected to him. You see, we don't measure ourselves by the amount of sin that we have or we don't. That's looking backwards. We look forward to so how is my relationship with the Lord doing and and not bringing a set of rules and regulations into it, 
but letting love be the guide in your life. And as you draw near to the Lord, guess what's gonna happen to the things that you've been separated from? They're gonna fall farther and farther away from you. Don't measure yourself by the things of the past. Measure yourself by the proximity of the relationship with Jesus Christ uh, and your commitment to, to engage in a healthy relationship with the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time. And God, we ask that you would just help each and every one of us in our relationship with you. God, that uh, we wouldn't be looking back at what we've been saved from but that we would be looking forward to what we've been separated into. So God, bless us and help us. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.